la transfiguración de Jesús. Seis días después, Jesús tomó a Pedro, a Santiago y a Juan, el hermano de Santiago, y se fue aparte con ellos a un cerro muy alto. Allí delante de ellos cambió la apariencia, apariencia de Jesús. Su cara brillaba como el sol y su ropa se volvió blanca como la luz. En esto vieron a Moisés y a Elías conversando con Jesús. Pedro le dijo a Jesús, Señor, qué bien que estemos aquí. Si quieres, haré tres chozas, una para ti, otra para Moisés y otra para Elías. Mientras Pedro estaba hablando, una nube brillante se envolvió en su sombra. Y de la nube salió una voz que dijo, este es mi Hijo amado, a quien he elegido. Escúchenlo. Al oír esto, los discípulos se postraron con la cara en tierra, llenos de miedo. Levántense. Jesús se acercó a ellos, los tocó y les dijo, Levántense, no tengan miedo. Y cuando miraron, ya no vieron a nadie, sino a Jesús solo. Mientras bajaban del cerro, Jesús les ordenó, no cuenten a nadie esta visión hasta que el Hijo del Hombre haya resucitado. La palabra de Dios. Gracias al Señor. La misma lección en inglés. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up. Do not be afraid. When they looked up, They saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Jesus mentioned to his disciples not to talk about what they had experienced. But this morning's sermon will be downright mystical. We will consider human encounters with the divine. These encounters may lead to a deeper sense of discovery for our faith journeys. A mystical experience with the divine may even lead to some clarity. Such clarity came to a woman as she decided to try for the first time ice fishing. So she went out. She cut a hole in the ice. But just then she heard a loud voice say, there are no fish under the ice. Amazed at hearing a voice speaking to her, she wondered if it could be God. She finally convinced herself she probably imagined hearing it, so she tried drilling it out. Again, she heard this voice. There are no fish under the ice. Is that you, God? She responded, to which she heard of the reply, No, ma'am, this is the ice rink manager. <laughs> Today's sermon is serious stuff, so I thought we'd start with an icebreaker. <laughs> Let us pray. 
with your loving spirit, pry open our tight grips, confining our hearts and our minds, O Lord. Unfetter them in the presence of your word. Release them from the mistaken belief that through our efforts we will find you. And ground them in the truth that it is through you and your love that we are found. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We must let go of our assumptions to best understand today's gospel lesson that Anna and I read. The three accounts of the transfiguration found in the synoptic gospels, including Matthew's version that we just heard, immediately provoke questions. Look no further than scholarship about the passage to reveal a discomfort with a mystical scene. More palatable are parables and more standard scripture passages like ethical exhortations and everyday accounts about Jesus entering the lives of people. But the transfiguration, that's a mystical experience. And mysticism always raises questions and causes misunderstanding. The scholars have made many assertions about what they think is actually really going on here in this mystical moment. One suggests that it's really just a misplaced story of Jesus' resurrection. Another thinks it is the second coming, and still others hold it's about Jesus' heavenly enthronement or his ascension. Now others call it a subjective vision, a dream, the disciples misunderstanding a natural event, or a made-up story to provide symbolic meaning. Even scholars really struggle to make assumptions when it comes to mystic experiences. But I suggest we align ourselves with the mystics of our Christian past to underst better understand the transfiguration. The Encyclopedia of Monasticism holds that the first Christian mystics were biblical. Figures such as Mary, whose experience of God in the Annunciation can best be described as mystical, a transcendent moment. Or think about St. Paul on the road to Damascus, envisioning Christ and his way, and even Christ himself, being transfigured on the mountaintop in the desert, being characterized as having experienced an imminent divine exchange that is the basis of all mystical experience. Centuries later, namely the late fifth century, mystical traditions and theologies formed around these experiences. But because mystical experiences seem so subjective and they're, they're so personal at times, people dismiss them in place of more concrete beliefs and understandings. Two known mystics, Marguerite Poiré and Joan of Arc, were actually killed at the stake because their societies were unable to accept the notion of their mystical experiences. Now I would posit that we New Mexicans may be a little more comfortable with the notion of mystical experiences. We live in a place rich with Roman Catholic and Native traditions steeped with mysticism. And we have mountains and valleys and other geographical sites that the Celts might describe as thin places or the distance between heaven and earth are just a little bit closer. Think Ghost Ranch, or the mountain peaks that the natives hold to be so sacred. It is often in these sacred scenes and sites that mystical experiences provide perhaps clarity, greater understanding, in life that we might otherwise miss. I'm reminded of a poignant exchange several years ago at a preaching workshop at Ghost Ranch Santa Fe, or what many of you know as Plaza Razzolani. Plaza the instructor was from New York. He was leading us through a session on narrative preaching when the topic of mystical experiences came up. Quite the rational thinker, 
he explained to the group of New Mexican pastors and commissioned lay pastors that we really know in this day and age we don't have mystical experiences anymore. To which the group shook their heads back and forth. Several New Mexican preachers proceeded to explain that mystical experiences still happen and that, by the way, they are real. It was on a mountain where Peter, James, and John experienced this mystical encounter with Jesus. And the experience was fraught with meaning. The Transfiguration account recalls other biblical accounts of visions and mystical experiences, but probably none more than Moses' experience in Exodus upon Sinai. It was on that mountain that God revealed the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law. And God even pulled back the veil separating heaven and earth and showed the glory of the divinity of Moses to Moses and to others. Now, you might remember last week I mentioned the biblical notion that no one can see God and live. Do you remember that last week? Moses' case is an exception, and then Exodus 24 proposed it, reports that Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement, as blue bright as the sky. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They, say God, they saw God, and they ate, and they drank. Passage goes on to say that while Moses was alone on the mountain, it was covered by clouds for six days. And on the seventh day, Moses entered the cloud and stayed for 40 days and 40 nights. It was then he received the commands on how to establish the tabernacle, and he received the covenant law. The mountain, Mount Sinai, was a thin place the setting of a mystical experience in which God granted Moses and the Israelites who had come out of Egypt, he gave them some clarity of mission and purpose. And as Moses came down from the mountain, his face shone with glory. So we fast forward to our passage. Jesus, after six days, just as Moses had waited for six days, summited a high mountain with James, Peter, and John. Now, Jesus had just told Peter that he was the rock upon which the church would be built. And in that mystical moment, transfiguration, Jesus transfigured, transfigures with his face shining like the sun and his clothes dazzling like our white banners. That invoking reminds us of Moses. And in fact, Moses and Elijah appear at Jesus' side. This is a mystical event. And what from it is revealed? <coughs> At first, the disciples seem to miss the meaning of the experience. Peter asks if he should make three tabernacles for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. He may have been hearkening back to Moses atop Sinai receiving instructions for a tabernacle, so he might have been trying to be smart to connect those events. But in this case, God was not revealing a need for tabernacles. While Peter was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. The clarity that comes from the mystical experience is to listen to Jesus. He had just been telling the disciples that he must suffer in the hands of the chief priests and the scribes, killed, and again raised on the third day. And if the disciples wanted to save their lives, they would have to lose them. God may have felt that it was necessary to communicate a little more directly because they weren't paying enough attention. How intriguing these mystical accounts are. I know from conversations with many of you over the years, often in Bible study, that many of you have had mystical experiences. Dreams that include a sense of communication from a loved one. Or moments in when you have had a strong sense of God's presence. And maybe for that moment, a taste of clarity. 
Modern life with its busyness, complex <coughs> demands, crowds out room for any type of that clarity. And yet clarity is often what we speak. What is our next step? What is God calling us to do? What should I be doing? Where should I be going? Should I be going to the doctor? Should I take that job? Is what I am doing being faithful? Sometimes we wish for God to hand us an easy-to-follow manual to help us navigate the cloudy realities that we are facing. And we want that guidance to come with divine authority behind it. It is not just our time and place that longs for deep understanding and union with God. Remember Paul's words from 1 Corinthians. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Jews demand signs, and Greeks, they need wisdom. We have cultural cues through which we see clarity. Paul claims that in, at that time, the Jewish culture wanted a sign to understand where they were to go. And the Greeks felt like they could be guided by, the, by wisdom. But God's guidance seems to always transcend where we think it ought to come from. Mystical experiences may come in many forms, dreams, sensations, voices and visions, a strong sense of divine presence, in moments of our lives, maybe when we take communion, certainly at the birth of a child, I would testify I had one, and at the death of a loved one, often we might experience some deep union with God. But the reality is, most of the time, we do not have such clarity. We must be patient, wait on the Lord, let go of a need for such a clear path. Often the clarity we seek is really what we want, when often the path we tread is not what we might first think of or choose. And yet, most people in this room, in this sanctuary, could probably name one or more times which they have had what I would dare to call a mystical moment, a time in which they felt a deep sense for God's love or purpose or direction or meaning. And in many of these cases, we may have been the recipients of a period of a moment of clarity, clarity we may so often be lacking. The transfiguration narratives are reminders to pay attention to that meaning you hear that voice saying, listen to Jesus? Listen. It may just be the divinely inspired voice. That is why we pray, we meditate, and we worship. When we do that, we shut out our assumptions, and we open our hearts and our minds to God. Faith is an open door, and when we cross over the threshold, we find the Spirit revealed. 20th century theologian Reinhold Niebuhr reminds us that individual selfhood is expressed in the self's capacity for self-transcendence and not for its rational capacity for conceptual and analytical procedure. Pay attention, meditate, pray, listen to what God might be saying to you. Be a pilgrim searching for God's direction from above. And it will lead to places that you can hardly imagine on your own volition. Reinhold's brother Richard held that pilgrims are persons in motion, seeking something we might call completion, or perhaps clarity will do as well, a goal to which only the Spirit's compass can point the way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.